let me make sure that you are kind of comprehending with this undeniable fact of life. It is way easier to be a poo stick than it is to be a salmon. Agreed? Yeah. Everyone know what a poo stick is? You played that game? If you've not heard of the game poo sticks, put your hand in the air. Right, let me explain this to you really quickly. Poo sticks is from when the poo. You stand on a bridge over a kind of flowing stream. This isn't ringing any bells? You stand on the side of the bridge that is kind of um, furthest away from where the stream is flowing, is that right? Upstream. Upstream, that's what I'm looking for. Um, and everyone picks a stick and you throw your stick over, at which point you sprint to the other side of the bridge and whosoever stick you see first wins. No one ever played that game? Yeah. Great. This is before Xboxes and all this thing, by the way. It's better though. So, a poo stick does what? It just floats with the stream. It goes with the current. Easy life. What's the difference between a poo stick and a salmon? What does a salmon do? Swims. Upstream. So, are we in agreement that it's easier, if you were to choose a life, poo stick or salmon, which is easier? Poo stick. This is going to make sense in a little bit. Happy with that? Okay. Floating with the current is easier than fighting against it. Now that is true, I guess, in the kind of battles you'll face at school. When you have a whole culture, a whole kind of community that are doing certain things, it is easier to go with the flow, correct? That might mean easier to go along when everyone is drinking or when everyone is experimenting or everyone is having sex or everyone is bullying someone. It's easier to be a poo than be a salmon. Correct? Uh, it may though be a battle within yourself. There is that sense, particularly if you're a Christian, that when you enter the Christian life, there are some things which were very natural, which you now have to fight against. Now you're a Christian. Some things that were easy, that now take a kind of graft to walk away from. And sometimes in the Christian life, there's a battle between us, and it's almost easier to go back to just going with our old selves than it is to fight upstream like a salmon and follow Jesus. Correct? It is easier to be a poo stick than a salmon. Now, some of us have been walking this Christian life for a while, but are temin, tempted to maybe go back to going with the flow. And some of us are feeling the heat of the struggle, fighting temptation, fighting addiction, battling against relapses, just the struggle that it is to get up and go against the flow of a non-Christian culture and to live as a Christian. Some of us are feeling that battle. Some of us might even have sacked the salmon thing and just become a poo stick again. Here's the bottom line. It is easier not to be a Christian. True? A Christian likes a war. The question then coming to Genesis 6 this morning is, why bother? If the Christian life's harder, why bother? Enter Genesis 6. Page 8 in your Bibles. Let's read from verse 8. But Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. A question Noah, poo stick or salmon? Salmon. What is the culture like around them? How is it described in those verses we read? Don't look at me. The answer is in your Bible. Violent. Violent. Corrupt. corrupt. Everyone. The tide of culture is corruption and violence. Verses 11 and 12. Corrupted earth. Corrupted by people that are full of violence. Humanity has ruined itself. And ruined creation. The word corrupt there has the idea of being distorted or twisted or perverted or defiled. Maybe like last week, it's been turned. 
Uh, look at the verse 13. The earth was full of what? <coughs> Violence. That phrase is meant to make you think back to Genesis 1, where God said to Adam and Eve, uh, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. The command, fill the earth, was a command to make babies and create life. But he now uses that same phrase. It is now not full of babies and life, but it is full of stuff that destroys life. Do you see how it's been perverted? You see how this creation has been corrupted by humanity? Now, you look at that, this is so many thousand years ago, but it is pretty much still the same today. <coughs> we live in Graceman in a community, we make up a community that is corruption and full of violence. And you can look at things like abuse within homes, you can look at anger within our hearts, you could look at stabbings, you could look at self-harm, you could look at bullying or gossip or slander, you could look at swearing or abortion or fraud. We're corrupt. I mean, take for example, right? You get a bunch of young teenagers in Gracemount. What is, what is it you find them doing? When they find a motorbike, steal a motorbike, find a motorbike, do they rally it and then burn it, or do they do it up and return it to its owner? They burn it. When the mansion is there and a bunch of young teenagers come, do they vandalize it or do they restore it? Vandalize it. Interesting. When there is a young person at school that is vulnerable and a little bit odd, do they encourage them or do they bully them? It's easier, right? There is something within the human heart that maybe is demonstrated very easily in young folk in Gracemount, but is in every single one of us that is now bent on, turned towards corruption and violence. And it's way easier to float that way. But here in Genesis 6 is a culture where everyone's a poo stick, everyone is kind of corrupted and floating in corruption and their lives are polluting the waters. But there's one man, and his name is Noah. And Noah is among them. It's, see the phrase used in verse 9? He is among the people, which means Noah's not this freak kind of up in some high tower removed from everyone. He's not hiding in a cave. He's not in retreat in some monastery. He is among the people. But although he is among them, he didn't like them. He's a salmon when everyone else is a poo stick. And two words are used to describe them. Righteous and blameless. Here's Noah among the people of this time. I think that's the first blank in your sheet. Righteous and blameless. Righteous means he's not defined by the corruption, by the violence, by the immorality of everyone else in the culture around him. But he's fighting against the tide for purity and for morality. Not violence, but peace. It's righteous. He's blameless. That word blameless has the idea of kind of wholeness, wholeheartedness, completeness. Everyone else's hearts have turned. We saw that last week. Turned to be only evil all the time. And yet here is Noah whose heart is wholehearted for God. He's not like Cain who gave this kind of half arsed thing of, oh, I'll worship you, but his heart's not in it. Now he is worshipping God with all of his heart, all of his soul, all of his mind, all of his strength. He's all in doesn't mean he's perfect, but here's a man who is living by faith in God, righteous and blameless. Now, think for a second. A culture where everyone's just drifting towards corruption and violence. One man who's righteous and blameless. How do you think the people of his community thought about Noah? Think he was liked? No, why? He's different. When someone's righteous and you're not, why don't you like them? Yeah, they make you look bad. The phrase that's used in a New Testament called Hebrews about Noah is that Noah, by his righteous life, condemned the world. And when you feel condemned, your hackles go up. Now, here's the question again then. Noah, why live this way? Because not only is it harder, but you'll be hated for it. 
Well, notice another thing. Why is he different? Why is he a salmon? Well, among the people of this time, he's blameless and righteous. But when it comes to being with his God, the phrase that's used is he is walking with God. Where did we hear that phrase before? Remember the guy's name who was described as walking with God? Enoch. Enoch walked with God. Same phrase. The people of his time, right, would have looked at Noah and saw one man on his own walking strange. What a freak. And yet, although it looks like Noah is walking alone and he's strange and he's different and he's a loner and he's a freak, what they fail to see, what their lack of faith keeps them from seeing is that Noah is not walking alone. He's walking with God. His wading against the culture is fueled by his walk with God. Like Enoch, it's that intimate name for being in step with and kind of personal with and intimate with the Creator God. Again, it's not saying that he is perfectly blameless and perfectly righteous, but that by faith he is in step with God, worshipping God, sacrificing rightly to God, so that God looks at him and says... I will credit righteousness to you. I will give you the righteousness that comes by faith. He is standing faithful. He is being pure in the face of a tide that is going the opposite direction. It's what makes Noah, Noah. Now let me give you 20 seconds to scan the rest of this chapter. Tell me what Noah says in Genesis chapter 6. Scan it quickly. And notice what Noah says. Boom. What does he say? He listens. Does he say a word? Nothing. Interesting. He's described as walking with God. It's almost as if by his silence, or by Moses recording his silence, that he's telling us his walk with God is not determined merely by talk. Right, some of us have been around church long enough to kind of learn a Christian language. And we come here on Sundays, we come on Tuesday nights, we've hung around with Christians. It's very easy to articulate, to talk about God. Some of us might even have said that we have professed faith in God. Some of us can even articulate what repentance would look like for us. And we can talk through the kind of sat-nav directions of our walk with God and say, yeah, this is what it's going to look like. I'll have to give this up. I'll have to start doing this. I'll need to work hard to avoid that. This is what it's going to look like. And we can talk the walk. But listen, the Christian life is not about talking about God. It is about walking with God. And some of us need to cut the talking about God and start walking with him. I'm reading the book of James this week. And James says that when we know the right thing to do, but we fail to do it, we sin. God says, didn't he give me your talk? Show me your walk. It is his walk with God that makes Noah wade against the tide of his culture. And you either float with the people of your culture or you fight like a salmon with Noah. You can't do both. The righteousness that comes by faith produces the obedience that comes with faith. Right, you walk with God, you walk against the tide. Let me ask you some questions. Right? If you are a Christian, if you profess faith in Christ, if you're a member of this church, let me ask you some questions. Would people in Grace Man your family, your neighbours, people at the school gates, say that you were a poo stick or a salmon? Would they say that you just roll with everyone else? Or that you're different? Would people know you are a Christian, not by the fact you say it with your gob, but by the fact that you are seen to be walking with God, by how you behave in your life? I wonder if the people you chat with at the gate of their house would say you're just part of the people of your time. You share their ways. Or would you be known for being different? It's a challenge, right? 
would they say that you are like light in darkness? Would they say that you're like salt in a corrupt earth? Would they say that you shine like a star? Would they say that like Noah, in a sense, you condemn them by your good deeds? Because the footsteps of Noah as he walks with God are meant to be the footsteps that we follow. Now again, I'm going as a Christian, knowing that life is hard as a Christian, knowing it's harder to be a salmon than a pussy. I'm going, how do you keep going? When it's not just hard, but you're hated for it. What would motivate you to keep going? We're going to read on from verse 13. I'm going to try and answer that question. Look at verse 13. So, God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people. For the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make for yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat with pitch inside and out. This is how you build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it. Leaving below the roof an opening of one cubit high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark. I make lower, middle and upper decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark. You and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you, you are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you and be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Now question. Um, who's the main character in what we've read? Who's the main character? Noah. I would say not. Because everything Noah does is in response to something that someone else does. Noah doesn't speak. Noah listens. It is the Lord God who is the main character in this story. He speaks. He shows Noah favour. He sees the earth. He speaks to Noah. He warns Noah. He commands Noah. He initiates a covenant. He keeps people alive. He promises a new start. It is the Lord God that your eyes are meant to be on in this chapter. And it is the Lord God that we're told in verse 13, sorry, verse 12, sees the corruption on earth. God sees. Listen, do not believe the lie that God doesn't see the corruption and violence that happens in the privacy of your home. He sees. We are not hidden from God. He sees, and it's what the Lord see that caused him to speak to Noah. Look at verse 13. What God has seen in people means he's putting an end to people. He's going to bring destruction. You want to read it instead of me, Pop? <laughs> you found a better preacher? I can, I can take the offence. Don't worry, Pop. All good? Look at verse 13 again then. What God has seen in people means he's putting an end to people. He's bringing destruction. I think the language in verse 17 is frightening. He is taking away life. When in Genesis 2 we were told that God gave life to Adam, the idea is that God breathed life into Adam's nostril. The, the intimacy of the relationship was mouth to nose. He breathed life. And now the very breath that the Lord God has breathed into humanity's lungs has been used by us humans to breathe out evil. And so the Lord says, I'm taking that life back. The breath will be gone. And verse 17 just says it so starkly. Everything on earth will perish. 
we miss a song, we sing a song, you know, kid song. The animals went to do ba do ha ra ha ha ra all these stupid songs about Noah. How badly does that miss the tone? Everything on earth will perish. And it's just, it's deserved. We saw that last week. The creator has the right to curse or whoever has corrupted his creation. The creator has the right to destroy those who have turned his creation from a place of peace and life into a place of war and violence. And so as Noah walks with God, he hears the voice of God speaking the promise of judgment. The floodwaters will rise, all life will drown. And Psalm 29 says, the Lord sits enthroned above the flood. There is no mistaking, this is not just natural disaster, this is divine judgment. I think what I didn't notice until I read it again this week, verse 13, God said to Noah, the judgment is going to be on all life, but who gets the promise of judgment? One man. All life will perish. Every life will perish. But not every life gets the promise of judgment. It's actually the part that Jesus picks up on when he tells this story, retells this story. Matthew 24. Listen to what Jesus says. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. See that phrase? They knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. Jesus is making a promise again of a future judgment that's still to come for us. And he says you need to understand that just like in the days of Noah when people were just getting on with life. Eating, drinking, marrying. And then unexpectedly judgment falls. They did not know that it was coming. And Jesus is making that connection to say that when he comes again as the son of man at the end of time people will be scrolling through Facebook and people will be taking their kids to school and people will be folding the washing and people will be getting married and and it will come. They did not know that it was coming until the flood came and took them all away. See, floating like a poo stick may feel like you're lying on a lilo in a pool in Benidorm. The reality is you're in a river that's current is taking you towards the Niagara Falls and a certain end. If you're struggling as a Christian, if life as a salmon is getting wearisome and you think floating like a poo stick is going to be easier, you need to remember this. You need to hear this. It may feel like you are wading upstream, but you need to remember you are wading away from judgment. That God has taken hold of you, he has turned you, and he is leading you out of hell. You need to remember that. Only Noah got the warning. It's interesting this thing. See if all those people had heard the warning. Do you think they would have responded? How do you think people would respond? Judgment's coming. What likely response are you to get if you said that to someone today? Jesus is coming again. He is going to judge everyone and the evil, corrupt and violent world is going to go to hell. How do people respond? Yeah. Yeah. Like, laugh. laugh. It's scoff. My guess is that in Noah's day, in our day, it's how people respond. Imagine in Noah's day, someone gets this warning and they're looking at Noah building an ark in the middle of the desert and say, what are you up to, you whack job? The sun's shining. The promise of judgment came when the sun was shining and so people scoff. 
But if any nation on the planet Earth knows, us Scots know that just because it is sunny today does not guarantee that it won't rain tomorrow. And just because there is no sign of judgment today does not mean that it is not coming. One of Jesus' closest disciples, a lad called Peter, spoke of this warning and he spoke that just as Noah had scoffers, people scoffed at Peter as he told people this news. And so he stood up to him and he wrote a letter. And listen to what he says. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, these days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires, they will say, where is this coming he promised? Everyone, ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as has it been since the beginning. It's sunny. But Peter says, but they deliberately forgot that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By waters also, this world that... Sorry, by these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same words, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Just because it is sunny today does not mean that it will not rain tomorrow. Just because there is no sign of God's judgment today does not mean that it might not come tomorrow. The promise of judgment in Noah's day was not an empty promise. And the promise of judgment from Jesus for our day is not an empty promise. The fact that the floods came is proof that the fire will come. And the Lord is desperate for you. He is delaying deliberately for you that you might hear this promise of judgment and wake up. And turn around. Because what we're going to see is that into these flood waters of judgment, God floats a promise. A promise not of more judgment, but actually a promise of salvation. A covenant of salvation. Look at verse 13. Verse 13. I'm going to put an end to all people. But look what that flows into, verse 14. So, make an ark. Into the promise of judgment, I am going to put an end to all people as the floodwaters rise. God floats a promise of an ark. He says, Noah, make an ark. And by faith, Noah, when warned about what was not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark. He didn't scoff. He rightly feared the promise of the holy God's judgment. And he trusted the holy God's way to salvation. It's interesting to think about the ark. What is the ark? It's a wooden box. What did the ark contain? It basically contained a starter kit for a new creation. No. What was inside? A family and two of every animal. Why? Judgment is coming. This will save you. But what is inside the ark? A starter kick so we can go again. So that although this ark will float above the judgment waters that are coming and will destroy a world full of violence, this starter kit for a new creation contains within it a promise of New life. You see? The ark and its contents is a promise of a new world. It is a covenant, a promise, a solemn word of security for Noah. It's the first time this word covenant is used in the Bible. It won't be the last. And what we see of this covenant is going to be the outline of and the kind of sketch of and the pattern of every covenant that's to come. And the point here is that yes, this covenant, God says, I promise, will keep you alive through judgment. But it's not just I'll keep you alive through judgment. It is that after judgment there will be new creation. Got to get both sides of that. It is not just life despite judgment. It's life beyond judgment. Now the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, like the ark of Noah saves you from the judgment of God. 
That is what the New Testament is going to explain as the better covenant, the new covenant. If you've never understood what Jesus Christ does at the cross, the ark in this story helps you understand it. That just as Noah and his family are saved in the ark through their relationship to Noah, so too Christians are saved through the cross because of their relationship to Jesus. God saving Noah is a picture of what God has done to save us through Jesus. As Jesus dies on the cross, he is sheltering us from the judgment of God to save us from the judgment of God. And by being in Christ, that is, by putting our faith in Christ, it is like being sheltered in the ark. The judgment falls on him so that it wouldn't fall on me. But God doesn't just rescue you from judgment. This covenant of salvation is a promise of a new creation. And let me speak to you again, right? If you're struggling as a Christian, struggling to fight on like a salmon, tempted to go back to the old world and just float with the culture, you need to fuel wading upstream with the promise contained in the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus is like the ark. What was inside the ark? Life. A starter kit for a new creation. The ark was bustling and brimming with life. With basically two of everything so they could make babies and make more life. What is the resurrection of Jesus? It is the promise of new creation. It is the promise of a better world, a pain-free, sin-free, death-free, curse-free world. All that corruption you feel within your heart, all that double-mindedness you feel within your heart, all those perverted desires, all the guilt of violence in your past, all the ways that you have corrupted and destroyed your family and your community... Because the new covenant brings new hearts that are destined for a new creation. I've got to cling on to that. When I'm wading upstream, I'm not just wading away from the Niagara Falls. But I'm walking with God to a promised homeland. Where there is no corruption and no violence. Only peace and life. You know what that means? The struggle to live a blameless life. The struggle to live a righteous life. The struggle to be wholehearted for God. The struggle to leave friends and family and old lifestyles and habits behind. Do you know what this means? It's not in vain. Your righteous life, your obedience to God is not in vain. He has saved you from the judgment to come. And he will save you for the new creation to come. The ark is our hope, saving from judgment, but floating us to new creation. So here's what I want to say to this morning, two very simple things. If you are a Christian, fighting like a salmon, keep going. It's worth it. But see if you're a poo stick, floating your way to judgment, wake up. I plead with you. It will come as in the days of Noah. You will not know that it's coming. But if you do not wake up, put your faith in Christ, repent of your sins, then hope is lost.